My name is Morel Doucette, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist based here in Miami, Florida. My practice involves illustration, ceramic prints, to examine the realities of climate change and seawater rise here in the city. I'm Adrienne Chadwick, an artist and art administrator who lives here in South Florida. My work is about power and resistance in society and nature, and so this comes about in many different mediums. I don't work in a specific medium. Right now, I'm working a lot with ceramics, but I've also done installation with many different types of materials. I have one piece called Ebb and Flow that takes form through recycled plastic bags from grocery stores and, and stores. So when it comes to my work in climate change, I very much look at scientific data and what's going on throughout the globe here in, in the state of Florida. And then I try to disseminate that information through the work that I'm making. With my ceramic work, I'm looking at sea life the pollution, um, blue-green algae, the red ties, then creating work to reflect these pressing issues that are happening here in the state of Florida. And then with my illustration work, I'm looking at the idea of climate gentrification, where communities of color are being impacted by the climate. So when it comes to seawater rise and the materials that I'm using, um, I essentially call them like, I'm using the carbon footprint of nature. Um, when I go into a neighborhood, I gather the floor, the fauna, the rocks, the soil from that neighborhood, and then I then bring them into the studio in order to work with that process to define the work. So when you're looking at my portrait work, you'll notice there's different textures, different patterns, and all of those come directly from the plants that I'm gathering in these neighborhoods. The neighborhoods I've been to vary from Overtown, Miami, to Atapata, Miami Gardens. So really the black and brown spaces and spaces that are being gentrified as we um, are looking around. One thing about ceramic that I really love in particular is really the material so textile, you know? So for me, um, it's not only just studying the text and the scientific data, but really how to disseminate the information. And so if you notice in a lot of my work, um, there's a lot of attention to detail and the way the texture is the rendering the form. And if I could summarize my work in one word, I would use the term magical realism, where I'm borrowing from real life, but then there's so many other nuances in how that works and what it becomes and how it manifests into other forms. So over the last 
two and a half years. I've been working on a body of work called Water Grease and the Six Shades of Death, um, where essentially is looking at the idea how water um, has been present since the beginning of time, you know? And the, the like water holds memory, it holds weight, um, our bodies is made out of water. Um, really, every life form on the planet contains some ounces of water in it. Um, and so through that um, idea of that metaphor, I'm um, juxtaposing it with the community in the landscape. So behind me, I have a work in that series called The Night Garden, Water Baptized the Soul of Our Feet. And so you'll notice there's two figures, and the figures are blue, and there's various embellishments on that figure. So they're essentially merging between the background, the environment, and themselves. So in a lot of my portrait work, um, I, I want the figure to appear regal. Um, I want us as a viewer to feel privileged to kind of glimpse or have insight into that person or into the personality of that person. Um, and so you'll notice oftentimes the figures are not very defined. It's more, sure, it's, it's more, more so a silhouette of that person. And I thought that you know, that silhouette commands a lot of presence and a lot of energy. Placement, and it's a long-term series that I've been working on with ceramic clay houses. Each house is handmade intentionally instead of using a mold or an extruder or different techniques that could make identical houses. I choose to make them without measuring so I just hand make them. I make clay strips first with using my eye, no, no, no ruler, and then cut them up and, and cut the pitch on the roof to make the houses. Sometimes my work uses recycled materials and found materials, but these houses, interestingly enough, are made out of clay, and clay is made from the earth. You know, different minerals are pulled from the earth, and all the rocks are pulled out of it, and, and the minerals react differently to the firing process. So some clays are red, like this black clay is red when it's wet, but then when it's low fired, it turns into a speckled, a speckled beige color. But when it's high fired at a high temperature, they become this beautiful, glossy, luscious brown. And then the porcelain is um, also high fired, but porcelain is a really fine, um, soft, talc-like clay that um, when it's low fired it becomes like a chalky substance but when it's high fired it becomes this beautiful kind of almost see-through color. It's very meditative to work in the clay. It's just so soft and, and cool and cold and wet. It's really relaxing to just get into this process of making house after house after house. A lot of my works involve that repetition. I think it stems from being a printmaker when I was in art school. And so I think that there is a sort of meditation and a narrative that goes on in my head when I'm thinking about these stories or everything that I've ever learned about a subject, you know. I grew up here in um, South Florida for over the last 20 years. So growing up from elementary through, um, through now, I've noticed the drastic change in the infrastructure here in the city. In my neighborhood, for example, is one of the higher elevations in the city. So a lot of the developers are moving in and they're canvassing the area to buy properties. And so over time, when it comes to real estate, it's become very little left in the city. And so um, communities at the moment are being displaced. And so I know a couple of families who own their home, 
but they cannot afford the property tax in the area. And so because of that, they've been forced to sell their home and move to a cheaper area. And people that have money and capital are coming in and they're taking over. I wanted to talk about South Florida and the architectural history that has occurred naturally because of the environment and because South Florida, when it was first being built, was built along the coast. And then every decade or every few years, you know, a new layer of, of buildings were built further and further west. And it's interesting how this series has come back intermittently throughout history. You know, it came up again in around 2005 when we had our housing crash in South Florida. And I lived in downtown Miami at the time and was kind of love living in a neighborhood that is a little bit um, rough around the edges. And so living in Midtown at the time, there was no Midtown and Wynwood was really still warehouses. And so to see my preferred neighborhood, rough around the edges, turn into this glossy kind of like, you know, high rise heaven, um, this, this piece, this series came up again at that time. And then now again, when we're talking about climate gentrification and how um, people who live in neighborhoods who've lived there for many years are along, not along the ocean, but close to the east, to the east coast of, of our of our city. Um, they're being pushed out of some of these neighborhoods and being pushed all around the place. And so this is what how this piece has evolved. Um, just kind of thinking about the architectural history, but then thinking about the longer term history and the inequities um, that happened to, to black people over time. Um, resettlement is another piece that uses only black houses and it has the symbolism of redlining through different weights of red thread that hang over and around the houses. Um, and so that one's primarily talking about redlining and policies that happened in the mid-century um, with housing. Displacement includes porcelain, white porcelain houses with the black earthenware clay, uh, clay houses. And that's talking about how African-American people have been moved and shuffled around in South Florida and around the nation forever <laughs> since the Atlantic slave trade, you know, and this series is first about housing and, and where people live, but climate change and the environment, even from the early history of South Florida, it was involved. So when it comes to those different facets of climate change and how it affects the individual, it's very complicated. I would say it's a combination of a, the homeowner educating themselves about what is going on in terms of the environment. Um, we can't rely solely on government and policy to make changes. Some things that the city can do um, by planting more of the uh, mangroves. The, the uh, mangroves are really our first line of defense in the city when it comes to hurricane and the rising of the, of the seawater. And then when it comes to just policies, if we as a, a state um, go from denying <laughs> the idea of climate change to embracing it, and then we can essentially come up with effective ways or at least give people a timeline to leave and exit. I believe within our lifetime, um, Florida and many of these coastline cities will experience the greatest exodus in our entire human history, where these communities are going to be forced to be displaced. And we're all gonna be having to move inland because of that.